Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming to this talk this evening, organised by Photo London and in response to the Caroline Schneeman Body Politics exhibition currently on view at the Barbican here in London. Um, the show is on view until the 8th of January, so you still have many weeks to visit um, and I hope this talk might encourage you to do so if you haven't already, if you're based in London. Um, presenting Schneeman's radical vision, energy and creative expression, this is the first UK survey of the artist's work and the first major exhibition since her death in 2019. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to let you know that you can use the Q&A function throughout um, this session um, to submit questions as I speak and um, we'll have a chance to open up questions to you at the end. So yeah, please do feel free to, to jump in with your questions and um, that function during the talk. So I'll just share my screen, bear with me one second. So, Carolee Schneeman. Schneeman was a trailblazer who worked tirelessly for six decades to make work addressing the taboos around women's experiences and bodies, setting out to challenge centuries of oppression and to find inspiration from what she called her missing precedents. A history of creative, powerful women that had been deliberately disregarded. She made work and performances about the conditions of being in her own body and with numerous collaborators explored collective sensory bodily experience. She was concerned with the precarity of both humans and animals, and she was compelled to bear witness to the injustices and suffering caused by violence. She was both a feminist and political activist through her work. For Schneeman, the personal was political, but the political was also personal. So this exhibition, Carolee Schneeman Body Politics, has been three years in the making. And in a strange turn of events, the exhibition was given the green light here at the Barbican just as Schneeman passed away in 2019. So she never actually knew about the show. But it's been quite a challenge to conceive a show like this without an artist's input and insight, especially such a formidable one who tenaciously and persistently worked to craft her legacy throughout her life. However, I spent the last few years getting to know Schneeman in a different way through her archives. So I visited New York many times to, to see her wonderful house and studio, which is an incredibly resonant context for many of her works, um, as well as meeting with artists and scholars who knew and had worked with her. And I spent a year kind of immersing myself in her bibliography. I planned a key trip to, February, to uh, the West Coast of the US in February 2020 to spend time in her archives, which are split between the Getty Research Institute in LA and Stanford University Libraries. But little did I know at that point that we were about to spend the next couple of years with extremely limited research access and a pretty much virtual existence. So during the pandemic that ensued, the curatorial team and I had access to a huge digitized version of Schneeman's archives. And when I say digitized, I just mean thousands of my own iPhone photos. But this turned out to be a gift. And we spent hours in our separate homes and on video calls trawling through this archive everything from letters and poems to photographs, performance scores and notes, costume sketches and the costumes themselves, and amazing ephemera, including Schneeman's own beautifully designed flyers and programmes. And these archives are incredibly incredible living collages of material that Schneeman had kept herself with great care and foresight before handing them over to the Getty at Stanford. And collage, this idea of collage is a lens that I came back to again and again, considering Schneeman's practice, a mode that I saw across her work as a means of transformation, a process of fracturing, splitting open, juxtaposing materials and ideas to create something new. And in a certain sense, we can think of this archive itself as a work of collage, carefully pieced together by the artist herself. And as a woman artist without commercial gallery representation for many years, who worked with performance as one of her key expressions, Schneeman had taken it upon herself to be her own archivist, to document her own life and work because she knew that if she didn't, no one else would. And she was ensuring a legacy for herself. So these hundreds of photographs, slides, negatives and contact sheets, many of which are in the exhibition, shine a light on just how many photographers she would invite to each of her performances. From the early 1960s, she was acutely aware of the fact 
that her work in performance was indeed ephemeral. And in order to have any life beyond that moment, it had to be carefully captured on film. So these photographs and moving image documentations, which Schneeman often edited into her own amazing film collages, have been absolutely crucial to the challenge of bringing her work back to life through our exhibition. So on to the exhibition itself. This evening, I'll walk us virtually through the trajectory of the show, which sets out to consider Schneeman's radical work across the span of her lifetime, bringing her to new audiences and exploring how she made art from and of the body in a way that feels resonant, urgent and inspiring today. So the first section of the exhibition is titled A Pioneering Painter. And I wanted to begin by reading out this quote from Schneeman. I'm a painter, I'm still a painter, and I will die a painter. Everything that I have developed has to do with extending visual principles off the canvas. So Carolee Schneeman understood herself first and foremost as a painter, and she insisted I began to draw before I could speak. It was kind of her creative possibilities were there from the very beginning. She was born in Fox Chase, Pennsylvania in the 1930s, and she spent a rural childhood assisting her mother with domestic chores, watching her physician father treat patients and caring for her younger siblings. Her parents encouraged her to become a typist, which of course is very different from the trajectory that she would embark on. And in 1952, she began undergraduate studies at Bard College in upstate New York, arriving on a full scholarship. Two years later, she was expelled for moral turpitude. The college at that time had no life models, prompting Schneeman to paint her own naked body instead, and her confident rendering of her own image defied conventions. And this is a painting not for which she got expelled from college, but kind of a few years later from 1957, um, where you can see this amazing kind of nude melding into the landscape um, of brushstrokes behind her. So this bold gesture of Schneeman painting her own body foreshadowed the artist's lifelong to commitment to making art of and from the body, as I said, despite social resistance and art world incredulity. Schneeman moved to New York City in 1954 and she transferred her scholarship to Columbia University and the New School for Social Research. And the city at this time was a hotbed of modern art and her works from this period respond to turn of the century post-impressionism and contemporary abstract expressionism. I think you can see that in these amazing landscapes here, particularly um, the fact that Schneeman was inspired by the French artist Paul Cézanne, whom she had initially mistaken for a woman, thanks to the Anne in his name. But Cézanne's semi-abstracted landscapes allowed her to think about, as she said, the act of painting as space. The canvas was this sort of dynamic extension of her body. And as well as listening to music while she worked, she would often dance before starting to paint. In her early paintings that we see here from the 50s, Schneeman disrupts the surface of the canvas with lush gestural brushwork that hovers between figuration and abstraction. And these works are as much events as they are pictures. Some of them are even kinetic from 1957, activated by moving parts. So this work is actually mounted on a potter's wheel so that a potter might use to kind of throw a ceramic vessel. So she even mounts the canvas on this wheel and literally kind of spins it as she paints, creating this incredibly dynamic, um, animated uh, kind of field of colour. Um, and you can see Schneeman here on the right, activating the painting herself, spinning it, um, as we do every hour in the gallery itself. So in an art world dominated by men at that time, which Schneeman coined herself as the art stud club, Schneeman really painted by her own rules. The next section of the exhibition we titled Breaking the Frame to reflect just this. Her experiments in painting in the early 60s grappled with the limits of the flat canvas and her kinetic paintings, which she referred to as painting constructions and concretions, expanded beyond the frame, incorporating objects and photographs, into swathes and swashes of bright, bold color. Schneeman experimented with materials both everyday and ephemeral. In the painting on the left, one window is clear, notes to Lou Andrea Salome. She even evoked sound by fixing reels of unplayable audio tape to the bottom of the canvas. You can see them kind of cascading like a waterfall on the left here. And this audio tape actually held recordings of Schneeman reading the female psychoanalyst Lou Andrea Salome, who'd been incredibly kind of overlooked and not given the same platform as psychoanalysts such as Freud. 
So this this um this tape um holds the voice of Schliemann reading out Salome's writing, um, a woman who come before her and that she is so admired. In the late 1950s, in 1959, Schliemann won a graduate scholarship to study art at the University of Illinois. And when she returned to New York in autumn of 1961, the city's art world had moved on from abstract expressionism's formalism, and artists were really testing out new ways of making work. In 1959, artist Alan Kaprow initiated the term happening for experiences which invited viewers to participate in co-authoring an artwork, which really anticipated the development of performance art. Um, and dance, theatre and installation thrived in conversation with painting and sculpture, which echoed Schneemann's own interest in challenging the boundaries of different art forms. And you can see here in this work, Sir Henry Francis Taylor, Schneemann incorporates everything from a portrait of the early English dramatist Francis Taylor himself. See that on the right. Um, the little snippet from um, a magazine like Playboy of a nude woman on the bottom left, but also incorporating a uh, lover's underpants cast on the right. And she quickly became enmeshed in New York's art scene. In 1962, she hosted a debutante party to mark her emergence in New York City at her 21st Street loft, and she invited all the artists that she had met or heard of. She recalled that we celebrated anything and everything, and that she went to parties of a hundred sweating, rocking, streaming, rapturous, stamping, flying artists moving around their network of lofts. Schneemann took part in Klaus Oldenburg's 1962 installation Store Days and events at the studio spaces of artists Robert Rauschenberg and Andy Warhol. So you can get a sense of this amazing scene that she was very much part of. And she was, of course, very influenced by her peers and friends. She described Rauschenberg's sculptural assemblages, which incorporated found objects, as having the vision of now. So the question of how a painting could be understood as an event or a kind of act of everyday life remained one of her central preoccupations throughout her life. This is an amazing work, uh, Fur Wheel, which also springs into action. Um, it's activated on the motor and these, these tin cans that hang off it, almost like a chandelier, um, the clank into motion and make this cacophonous soundtrack. So the next section of the show focuses on Schneemann's really intriguing box construction, she called them. Very early on as a child, Schneemann learned the word gestalt in an art class at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And gestalt refers to a unified whole that is more than the sum of its parts. Schneemann's box constructions that you can see here are small experimental sculptures that embody this very idea. They bring together multiple objects and their associations in chance configurations. And you might be thinking immediately of the artist Joseph Cornell as we look at these boxes. And in fact, Schneemann knew Cornell incredibly well. She was introduced to him in 1959 by their mutual friend, the experimental filmmaker Stan Brackage. Cornell made boxed assemblages like this and composed seemingly random items in these sort of glass fronted cases. And Schneemann and Cornell bonded and shared an interest in the space which exists between waking and dreaming. And this idea of kind of drawing unlikely associations between objects, sounds and ideas to create new surreal images. Schneemann had already begun building her paintings beyond the canvas, layering their surfaces as we've seen and incorporating three dimensional objects. But these box constructions allowed her to compose elements in a more kind of diorama like environment. And although they do have an affinity with Cornell's work, they have their own very distinct energy some incorporating references to her own life. And many are marked with broken glass and objects which have been smashed or burned. Schumann's meeting with Cornell actually coincided with a fire in her painting studio, initiating an interest in employing controlled burning as a material process, both a painterly medium, but also perhaps as an act of choreography. In these works which take this method as their title, and we can see one here, controlled burning, for Yvonne Rayner's Ordinary Dance from 1962. Schneemann used resin to fix photographs and glass shards inside wooden containers, painting over their surfaces before filling them with straw. She then would douse the contents in serpentine, set them on fire, quickly close the lid while they were burning, before opening the box to reveal an exploded interior, which is what we see here. So the resulting works are these amazing kind of charred, glittering um, pieces that shine with refracted light and kind of spill over with these drips of paint and, and shards of glass.
We've also incorporated a lot of archive and ephemera in the exhibition, and these are just two examples um, of Schneemann's amazing life books, which were these sort of documents, these scrapbook books where Schneemann collated photographs and sketches and notes on friends and um, kind of behind the scenes process of her life and work. So the next section of the, the exhibition we titled Transformative Actions after one of Schneemann's most iconic early performances, Eye Body 36 Transformative Actions for Camera from 1963. So the year before this performance in 1962, Schneemann rented a studio on West 29th Street, which was a former furrier's workshop littered with the detritus of the trade and covered in a patina of fur. We've seen scraps of this fur from those early um, painting constructions, particularly that work fur wheel. Um, that I paused on earlier. So over the next 30 and more years, Schneemann's studio and her life really shaped each other. In this huge space, Schneemann's assemblages became bigger and more sprawling, inviting greater physical interaction. And her understanding of painting as dynamic, physical and layered led her to a dialogue with her own body. She became attuned to the fraught position of women in the art world. And she asked herself this crucial question, can I be both an image and an image maker? She understood her body not just as a subject, but as something with which to experiment in creating work. So in this work, I Body 36 Transformative Actions for Camera, Schneemann began to visualize an answer to this question. She staged a performance in her studio amidst a collection of works in process. She marked her body with paint, she interacted with her assemblages and she became an element within them. And eye body really marks this turning point in Schneemann's work by insisting that her body holds equal weight as both artist and subject. She was really aware of the image of her own image and also the privileges it afforded her, but also of the limits that it imposed on her. So as a young woman, she very much realized that she embodied American conventions of white thin feminine beauty, but her gender socially predetermined her to the roles of wife and muse. And so throughout her life, she would make work that challenged these prescribed limits. She understood her physical self as a site of knowledge and contested the positioning of women as passive subjects rather than active makers. You can see a few more details of this amazing performance here. And these are some of the incredible uh, assemblages that, that you can see sort of as part of this landscape in the studio behind her that she kind of almost became integrally related to through this performance. So in the 60s, Schneemann was also a founder, founding member of Judson Dance Theatre, a group of choreographers, dancers, musicians, composers, visual artists, and filmmakers. And together they explored non-traditional artistic processes, centering on the gestures and materials of everyday life. Work ranged from choreographer Yvonne Rayner's minimalist interrogations of traditional dance phrasing to Schneemann's jubilant group performance with piles of loose newspaper, newspaper event, which you can see here from 1963. Schneemann was the first visual artist to join the group, which also included dancers and choreographers Rayner, as I've said, Steve Paxton, Deborah Hay and Fred Harco. So in the basement gym at the Judson Memorial Church in Greenwich Village from 1962 to 1964, Judson Dance Theatre hosted scores of events and performances, many of them group efforts in which the members collectively realised the visions of their fellow contributors. And Schneeman recalled that Cage and Cunningham became friends that attended everything that she made. She described it like an electrical nest with everything connecting. The Judson style was characterized by improvisation, collaboration, and a rejection of technique and formal training, which Schneemann herself was particularly interested in. Participants held what they called concerts of dance, during which new works were performed alongside experimental soundtracks. And programs for these concerts and other Judson events map a dense network of collaborators, which Schneemann described as an uncircumscribed community, cooperative, competitive, audacious, unconscious of how deeply we moved within one another's dreams and efforts. In conversation with the Judson scene, Schneemann's kinetic painting developed into what she began to call kinetic theatre. So Judson Dance Theatre really offered her a space to test ideas for performances, group actions, and different ways in which dancers could be used as her palette, as she called them. Immersive multi multimedia events like, like this one, Pro Melodion from 1963, 
emphasised her own collective approach to making art with her peers. And she was often drawing on kind of gendered tropes within these performances. So, for example, in, in Chromalodion, this performance includes a sequence where a kind of wolf-like man chases a woman off the stage, drawing on this kind of trope from, from horror films. This incredible performance, Noise Bodies, which she performed with her partner, James Tenney, um, she described as a, as a junk sculpture duet. And she, she and Tenney found the most clattering kind of cacophonous objects that they could um, bicycle wheels, costume jewelry, teapot lids, um, and fashion these amazing costumes and then stroked each other's bodies with these metal wands to create a kind of sonic um, soundscape around them as they moved. So Meet Joy from 1964. This is perhaps one of Schneemann's most well-known works. Um, in May 1964, Schneemann flew to Paris, where she'd been invited to participate in the Festival de la Libre Expression, organised by artist Jean-Jacques Lebel. And she'd had to raise money for this trip by, by um, staging a sale in her studio of many of her works. From her hotel window, she taped the sounds of the streets below in Paris. Schneemann had come to Paris, as I said, to debut Meet Joy, a group performance that she described as an exuberant sensory celebration of the flesh. And Meet Joy really grew from the principles of Judson Dance Theatre that Schneemann had been exploring. Basic instructions altered by improvisation, untrained dancers, ordinary materials for props and sets, and a soundtrack which layered Schneemann's street recordings with pop songs. So clad in feather and fur-trimmed underwear, the performers tangled together on the stage, first as couples, then in groups of men and women, and finally as a singular mass. They rolled, leapt, moved in tandem and alone, while shredded paper, raw fish, chickens and hot dogs rained down on the stage and buckets of paint spilled under their feet and over their heads. This created what Schneeman described as an emotional range shifting precariously between tenderness, banality, wildness, precision and abandon. Simultaneously comic, disturbing and exhilarating. So following its, its first outing in France, Schneemann telegrammed her partner, James Tenney, beautiful frenzy, wild meat joy, triumph, our love covers Paris. And days after this performance, she traveled to London to re-perform the piece at Denison Hall. And Schneemann recounted that meat joy in London ended abruptly when police entered one door as the performers ex exited another covered in blankets to be hidden on the floor of cars speeding away. A third performance then took place that year at Judson Dance Theatre in New York, and Meet Joy was reprised for a final time in 2002 at London Whitechapel Gallery. Schneemann described Meet Joy as an erotic rite, which reveled in flesh jubilation. But she also understood it as a work of realism. And she explained, I'm pleased when the audience response to Meet Joy is, yes, life is like that. For me, it is. I'm not interested in fantasy. And this idea of kind of life rather than fantasy extends into this incredible film Schneemann, um, Schneemann made from 1964 to 1967 called Fuses. And I'm just going to read out this quote on the screen. I wanted to put into that materiality of film the energies of the body so that the film itself dissolves and recombines and is transparent and dense as one feels during lovemaking. So upon returning from Europe in the summer of 1964, Schneemann moved to New Pulse in upstate New York. And a year later, she and her partner, Tenny, purchased the house in which she was renting rooms, which would remain her home until her death in 2019. This home was the site of Fuses, a self-portrait film collage which meditates on Schneemann and Tenny's erotic relationship. It was filmed over three years on a borrowed Bolex wind-up camera which only could record 30 seconds of footage at a time. Schneemann and Tenney positioned the camera, hanging variously from the ceiling, the top furniture, vantage points which share a consistent framing of the couple having sex. Fuses is unapologetically erotic, and it illustrates Schneemann's desire to, as she called it, touch tenderly and fuck fiercely. This film is a rare documentation of sex from a woman's perspective. Schneemann herself explained that no one else had dealt with the images of lovemaking as a core of spontaneous gesture and movement. So Fuses pictured Schneemann's erotic subjectivity on her own terms as a heterosexual woman invested, importantly, in non-reproductive sex. 
she refused to objectify or fetishize herself, emphasizing the lived sense of equity, as she described it, that existed between her and Tenny. And this film was actually made partly as a reaction to watching her friend Jane Brackage give birth in Stan Brackage's film, Window Water Baby Moving from 1959. And she even felt that this film cast Jane, who um, was Brackage's partner, who she even herself had actually painted in the 1950s as a muse rather than an artist in her own right. So the film was a kind of rebuttal and a response to that. Fuses itself was incredibly experimental in its technical innovations as well. Schneeman cut, spliced, scratched and layered the film. She baked it in the oven, she painted over it, dipped it in acid and exposed it to sun, rain and lightning. The reel became so thick that the film lab were unable to run it through their printer. And the film's collage tactics limit our access to Schneeman's body and to the sex acts depicted. Segments of white which are filmed out in the snow outside the house evoke, as Schneeman described it, that orgasmic space where you are out beyond wherever you are. At points we view Schneeman and Tenny from the cat Kitch's point of view, who is a crucial third presence in their domestic arrangement, and you see the cat Kitch recur throughout Schneeman's work as kind of news protagonist and collaborator, as well as many other cats that Schneeman shared her life with. In 1964, so the same year that she performed Meet Joy and the same year that she began Fuses, incredibly productive year, Schneeman travelled to Venice to see the Biennale, this biannual international art exhibition. And it was an incredibly moving and transformative experience for her. She navigated the city's labyrinthine buildings, bridges and narrow canals and experienced a sense of suspension. She described it as the amazing sense of merging and melting between sky and water, which led her to ask the question, how do you carry your own gravitational weight? This performance, Water Light, Water Needle, translates the vibrating, watery reflections of sun on marble walls and blurs the line between solidity and transparency. This performance set out to encourage sensory disorientation. It was initially conceived to be performed on the Grand Canal, where ropes would be strung across the water and performers would walk, climb or crawl between them. But in fact, in the end, Water Light and Water Needle were staged twice in America, at St Mark's Church in the Bowery in New York, and later at the Havemeyer Estate in Marwa, New Jersey. The performance took place on thick shipyard ropes suspended taut between the steel columns in St Mark's, and then in an organic tangle between the trees at Havemeyer. These amazing preparatory drawings and Schneeman's performances often began with the process of drawing. Um, these drawings show wonderful dynamic streaks and brush strokes in place of bodies. And these sort of beautiful diaphanous bands of watercolor indicate the shifting energies as the performers move alone and together. The performers themselves were instructed to think of the ropes as flesh extension. Schneeman instructed them to, to concentrate on feeling here not a literal emotion, but a sense of connectedness. The work that this performance involved was incredibly physical and demanding, and the performers became like some tightrope walkers, avoiding and confronting each other's bodies, swinging from plane to plane and having to very clearly communicate with each other and alert the other performer nearby when they changed a rope's tension. Schneeman wanted the movements not to be acrobatic or balletic, balletic but about the collective body of these performers, which were dependent on each other as they navigated the gravitational conditions of an environment in which they were once rooted and suspended. So after this kind of eight part um, first section of the exhibition, um, which walks you through these kind of key developments in Schneeman's work and life, um, how experimental she was across multiple media and the kind of incredible range of her her subject matter. The show then opens up as we move downstairs into our double height spaces at the Barbican into a much more porous thematic um, structure. So the first section downstairs in the second part of the exhibition is titled Body as Integral Material. And I'll read another quote from Schneeman just because her words are often so generative. The body is in the eye, sensations received visually take hold in the total organism. Perception moves the total personality to excitation. 
So for Schneemann, working with and from the body was a true gesture of liberation. She claimed her body as her subject matter, stating that I wanted my actual body to be combined with the work as an integral material. Schneemann rejected taboos centered on women's bodies and brought flesh, nudity and sexuality to the forefront of her work. She had this incredibly jubilant and embodied approach to creating art. And, which, and through this, she sort of challenged the privileging of the rational mind over the messiness of physical experience, a mind-body split, which was traditionally gendered as masculine-feminine. Training in the 1950s, as, as we've seen, amid the culture of abstract expressionism, which promoted the myth of the male artist's genius and his singular vision, Schneemann saw the body denied its obvious role in a painter's process. And so by the late 1960s, she began moving away from group performance and refocusing on herself, as we can see here, as a site and material. She rejected what she called this art stud club, and she claimed the right to her body and to be an artist at the same time. When a friend wrote to her in the 1970s about the fact that she always showed her naked body in her work, Schneemann wrote back in defiance saying, I do not show my naked body, I am being my body. In Schneemann's work, the body moves through the spectrum of human emotion, reflecting what it feels like to be alive. I'm just going to focus for a moment on this incredible work up to including her limits, in which Schneemann described her entire body becoming the agency of visual traces and a vestige of the body's energy in motion. In 1969, Schneemann had moved to London. And the following year, she staged an event titled Tracking in the corner of the London Filmmakers Co-op. She set up a harness hanging from the ceiling with a 12 foot rope and suspended in the light of a projector, she allowed the rope's movements to guide her. She became what she described as a randomized drawing machine, using her weightless body to mark the floor and walls. This performance trackings was presented again that year at New York's 10th annual avant-garde festival in a freight car parked at Grand Central Station. And then the performance evolved over several iterations in California, London, New York and Berlin, where Schneemann retitled the work up to including her limits. The demanding nature of this entranced period of drawing, as Schneemann called it, pushed her and her mark making to an extreme. She saw up to including her limits as a direct response to Jackson Pollock's intensely physical action paintings. Rather than stooping over the canvas, Schneemann used the rope to create this sort of anti-gravitational position in which she could activate her entire body and expand the canvas beyond its two-dimensional form. So these gestural marks left on the paper register Schneemann's movements while suspended on the rope. And they can be understood as extensions of the artist moving through time as well as space. She understood up to including her limits as both an installation and performance. Here, the paper, harness and video monitors um, that we can see here in the exhibition stand in Schneemann's place and bring her live body back into the gallery as a virtual presence. So of course, since this exhibition is staged in London, uh, we couldn't not focus a section dedicated to Schneemann's incredibly generative time here. She spent um, a lot of time in London. She's made several trips to the city in the 1960s to stage performances, including Meet Joy and to screen her films. And in 1969, she experienced what she termed as a breakdown due to the end of a relationship and also increasing anxiety that she would be prosecuted for her vocal stance against the war in Vietnam. So she relocated to London in late 1969, bringing the cat kitsch with her. She stayed briefly at Arts Lab, an underground creative space, until she secured a flat in Belsize Park. And her three years here were very productive. She devised a number of group and solo performances in the context of the politicised DIY atmosphere of the city's art scene. She was active in the London Filmmakers Co-op. She appeared in Stephen Dwoskin's film Times Four in 1971 and used the facilities at the co-op to finish her film Plumline. She published her own artist books and pursued experimental writing. She joined the community around independent publisher Bojess Prest, run by artists Felipe Ehrenberg and Martha Hellion in Devon. And in 1971, she met the artist Anthony McCall at a Listen Gallery opening and began what she termed as an exquisite romance. 
Schliemer described London as a little hospital, which nurtured her both personally and creatively, but she also remarked that public perception to her work here in the UK could be hostile and ranged between discomfort and superciliousness. For example, when she appeared nude on the exhibition poster for the group show Microcosm at Camden Arts Centre in 1971, it was then banned by London Transport, and she then received an anonymous letter which contained violent threats of firebombs and drowning. She performed everywhere at the ICA, as you can see here, for Naked Action Lecture in 1968, at the Roundhouse as part of the Dialectics of Liberation Congress. Um, alongside poet Allen Ginsberg and active black, black activist Oakley Carmichael. And she even performed on a train traveling from London to Edinburgh, roller skating up and down the carriage as part of its experimental performance festival, um, pe performing this amazing work, Isis Strip, Isis Trip, 1972. Schneeman stripped naked, donned a pair of roller skates and kind of whizzed up and down the carriage while reciting excerpts from Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. She was embodying, as she saw in, and as she referenced in the title, the fertility goddess Isis, this amazing kind of um, creative, powerful woman from, from mythological history she was drawing on in contrast to this kind of male logical philosopher. So her humour was always, her kind of biting wit and humour was always present amongst this kind of satire and critique. But Schneeman's Vietnam exile, as she called it, ended in 1973 when she, McCall and Kitch sailed to America and returned to her house in Newport. So the next thematic section of the show we titled Vulvic Space, coined after Schneeman's own term. Schneeman began researching what she called vulvic space in the 60s. And this included her interest in goddess, goddess worship, the vulva as a source of power, knowledge and energy, and taboos surrounding women's bodies. Schneeman had come of age before women's liberation and she did not take her feminism for granted. <clears throat> Beginning with her expulsion from Bard for painting her own new body, as we discussed earlier, Schneeman faced derision and she spoke out against patriarchal norms and challenged the way she was treated socially, sexually, and as an artist. She was also very vocal about her choice to not have children, prioritizing what she described as her deeper purpose to make art. She studied women's experiences across time and place and learned about the disappearance and misattribution of artifacts and images made by women, which she called called her missing precedence, and the resulting exclusion of women's creative and sexual expressions. In her own work, she highlights Western art history's failure to address a vast archive of symbols and images which equate women with power. And though she did use sex-specific language, Schneeman was committed to a feminism encompassing of all marginalized bodies. In 1976, in her own writing, she advocated for those confronting the conventions which their language perpetuates by using inclusive or neutral pronouns. And the, the scholar Jennifer Doyle writes on this beautifully in our exhibition catalogue. Doyle says that for Schneeman, the vulvic is not a biology, but a culture as femme, feminine and gendered as her work is. It also manifests experimental approach to thinking sex. Some feminist peers, of course, accuse Schneeman of being narcissistic and self-exploitative, making work from her own image, particularly when depicting her naked body. And these reactions perhaps demonstrate feminism's own process of coming to terms with what it means to inhabit a gendered and sexualized position and to claim erotic liberation. Schneeman's groundbreaking, groundbreaking practice and work in establishing a personal canon of women artists still stands as formative and pivotal contribution to feminist art history. But here I'm going to pause on another quite iconic work by Schneeman Interior Scroll, which you can see here on the screen, performed twice from 1975 and 1977. The two performances of Interior Scroll derive from a 1974 drawing depicting a woman pulling a long piece of paper from her vagina which we've just seen on screen. This image and the ensuing performances express Schneeman's belief in knowledge received from and in the body, rallying against the persistent valuing, devaluing of women's bodies and intellect. An interior scroll has become this sort of emblem of Schneeman's defiant and uncompromising feminism. Schneeman began by posing nude in the manner of a life drawing model, 
examining women's objectification in art and art history. And she then read from her text, Women in the Year 2000, which imagines a time when women artists will be free from discrimination. She was performing this work in 1975, so projecting forwards 25 years. And after reading this text, she extracted a tightly folded scroll from her vagina. And this scroll carried a further text, which she recited while unwinding the paper. In the first performance of the work in 1975, Schneemann warned women to be prepared, as she said, for the way a sexist society would treat them. So she positioned her writing literally within her body, claiming the vagina as a source of knowledge and power rather than subjugation, fear or erotic performance or fixation. She later commented, kind of looking back at interior scroll, I didn't want to pull a scroll out of my vagina and read it in public, but the culture's terror of my making avert what it wished to suppress fueled the image. It was essential to demonstrate this lived action about vulvic space against the abstraction of the female body and its loss of meaning. The second performance of interior scroll in 1977, um, came about when Schneemann had been invited to produce and introduce a programme of erotic films made by women at the Telluride Film Festival. Along with Stan Brackage, she had created a selection including Anya Spada's L'Opera Mouf from 1958, Mary Menken's Orgia from 1967, and Anne Severin's Near the Big Chakra from 1971, as well as her own films, Fuses and Plumline. I would have loved to have attended that screening. However, upon arriving, she discovered that the event had been titled, without her knowledge, The Erotic Women, a sexist and simplistic tagline that was contrary to the spirit of the films and their selection. Stephen made a last minute decision to perform Interior Scroll as an action in response to the misreading of these works. So in this iteration, in this iteration the scroll carried the text of a letter read in her film, Kitch's Last Meal, which was addressed to a fictional structuralist filmmaker who critiqued her films for their personal clutter, persistence of feelings, diaristic indulgence, and painterly mess. Schneemann also made incredible works addressing the taboos around women's bodies, including menstruation and women's sexual experiences. This is an incredible um, work, Sexual Parameters Survey, where she invited women to kind of document and classify their sexual experiences, um, noting the kind of characteristics of body, hands, mouth, genital size, genital charge, um, really kind of privileging and, and giving a space for women to, to celebrate and to document their own erotic lives. An amazing work from the 1990s, Unexpectedly Research, extends and showcases Schneemann's longstanding research into women's creativity. It features diverse depictions of women by women made in different times and cultural contexts. Schneemann mirrored these affinity images, as she called them, with her own art, drawing connections between, for example, a snake-wielding Minoan priestess from 2000 BC and her snake-covered form in eye body, and between a New Guinea owl goddess and her performance body collage, as you can see on screen. Schneemann reflected, I had to understand why there were no women artists in my inherited history. I had to crack the shell to invert, turn over, smash open. Why language and all speaking existed in only one gender, male, and all that was female was by inclusion, prescription, allowance. Why was there no female genital? I had to find out why I believe the basis of creation was a female force denied for 2000 years. I had to put the body where the mind was. So in the 1960s, feminists rallied around the cry, the personal is the political, spotlighting how the conditions of daily life are linked to oppressive social structures. And Schneemann's, in Schneemann's work, this maxim runs both ways. So the personal is political, but the political is indeed personal. She made the personal details of her life a political concern, but she also used her art to reflect on her own inextricability from local, local and global politics. Schneemann was called to activism during America's war in Vietnam, and her work began to engage with the cost of conflict and of human and environmental destruction. She understood the privilege of observation, as she called it, as the task of bearing witness. She needed to create empathy between those who shared in her privilege and those who did not. 
Her politics were anti-war and anti-imperialist and were rooted in a feminism which began but never ended with her own life experiences. So many of the works in this final section of the exhibition, which we titled Personal Politics, reflect the growth of mass media imagery during Schneemann's lifetime and her exposure to world events through newspapers and television broadcasts. Beginning with the war in Vietnam and, and this work here, Viet Flakes, from 1965, Schneemann began to become aware of how media reported diluted experiences of terror and atrocity, and how, as she described it, the personal experiences of the Vietnamese were reaching the public at a great remove. And this is kind of a great example of, of this kind of um, friction between the personal and the political. This is one of Schneemann's life books in which she's kind of taking scraps and, and newspaper clippings, documenting the Vietnam War and pasting them right next to an image of her home in up, upstate New York in Newport. So she can't forget these images in her domestic environment, they're always, always present. She saw attending to these experiences and their representations as a constant and necessary task. And this task really underpins her work from the 1960s through to the 2000s. And she responded to events from the civil war in Lebanon, the Bosnian war and the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York. In films like Viet Flakes, kinetic theater works like Snows and multimedia installations like Morong Things, we'll see in a moment, Schneeman addresses the macho violence of military intervention while probing the experience of viewing anonymized images of suffering. So through these anti-war works and these pieces that dwell in experiences of grief, mourning, precarity and illness, Schneeman confronts the deeply personal experience of navigating the political and reflects on how we're implicated in social power structures. Her film Viet Flakes was a stark indictment of the Vietnam War and used documentary images by anti, sorry, and the use of documentary images by anti-war artists during the 1960s was crucial in motivating the American public to protest the violence. However, as scholars like Melissa Ho have noted, and this is a quote from Melissa Ho, we cannot today regard Vietnam era works that incorporate unidentified images of Vietnamese suffering without pausing to recognize the human agency and subjectivity lost behind these pictures. This is a work, More Wrong Things from 2000, um, which she called one of her nightmare works. It's a mass of tangled cables and hanging television monitors enveloping the viewer in a frantic collage of short clips with footage of conflict, violence and destruction cut through with moments from Schneemann's own life. And this strategy of juxtaposition extends from her early films and reflects on the person, personal and kind of painful nature of what we often call global issues. A work like Mortal Coils from the 1990s, 94 to 95, reflects on Schneeman's own very personal experience of loss. In the mid 1990s, she experienced a succession of friends passing away, including John Cage, Derek Jarman, Charlotte Mormon, and Hannah Wilkie, from causes including AIDS related illness and breast cancer. So reflecting on aging, grief, and what it means to mourn, Schneeman created the installation Mortal Coils. Images of her deceased friends' faces and hands, these really kind of intimate parts of their bodies, are projected onto the gallery wall, as you can see here, interrupted by mirrors which move, refract, and dissolve the images. A collage of in memoriam obituaries from the New York Times covers another wall, and the names are erased to highlight the standardized tone and language of the writing. Binders hung from the wall collate personal and often irreverent tributes to Schneemann's lost friends. She remembers Hannah Wilkie suggesting, we should go strip at the Guggenheim during Joseph Boyce's lecture. Hung from the ceiling, thick coils of mechanized rope trace and retrace circles in small heaps of sand on the floor. An endless cycle which reflects on death and longing. Schneeman asks us to stay with this loss, to mark it and laugh with it, and to become hypnotized by life's incomprehensible coiling path. In 1995, Schneeman was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma and breast cancer. And during a trip to Vienna soon after this, she encountered a 17th century sculpture depicting an angelic figure driving a staff into the body of a witch. Serpents escape from the witch's nipples in this sculpture. 
And Schliemann saw this piece as embodying the paradoxical characterization of the feminine, pure and holy on the one hand versus threatening and erotic on the other. She later discovered that this sculpture had been used as a plague column, as it was called, to which people would pray for salvation during epidemics, equating women's bodies with disease. Schliemann herself had begun researching alternative healing practices and thinking about the ways illness had been historically configured as feminine and alien. The history of witch hunts through which generations of women, many with healing medicinal practices, had been tortured and killed in attempts to wield power and control over their bodies and creative agency. So this insulation play column, Known Unknown, from 1995 to 96, confronts Schneemann's own experience of cancer. Video monitors show mutating cells, breast exams, fruit being juiced, and Schneemann having sex. The monitors are kind of nestled in a mass of vein-like hay along with glowing silicon breasts. And enlarged images of Schneemann's own mutating cells are arranged as columns on the walls, interspersed with panels that describe the artist's response to the sculpture, as well as medical advice and diagnoses, ranging from stark clinical reports to very raw personal responses from cancer patients. As a kind of shrine-like construction um, in the corner of the room, oranges studded with hypodermic needles hang from the ceiling, as we can see here on the left. And this nods specifically to how Schneemann and her friend would practice injecting on the fruit before on Schneemann's own body. After her diagnosis, Schneemann resisted advice to proceed with a mastectomy, radiation and chemotherapy, concerned that they would obstruct the forms of pleasure which fueled her own life. So play column with its roots in the pathologization of women resists and questions narratives of illness and treatment and the gendered history of Western medicine. Schneemann sadly grappled with breast cancer for two decades until her death in 2019. So I'll just end by reflecting that Schneemann's work in itself presents us with bodies that are both celebrated and mourned. She responded to life and human experience in its full spectrum, moving through joy and ecstasy to pain and suffering. Her work continues, continues to empower and challenge and to prompt us to ask questions about the kind of world that we want to live in. So thank you again for joining me to explore this remarkable artist whose work continues to resonate, invigorate and challenge us. So I'm going to pause there and I'm just going to check um, the q and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and check if anyone's put any questions in. Please do, do feel free to, to enter a question now if you have one. I'll just wait a moment in case anyone wants to, to kind of have a think and reflect. I know it was a lot, a lot to digest. So no questions so far.
So perhaps um, if there aren't any questions, perhaps we'll just end there. And I know that Stephen's work provokes um, and challenges and stimulates us. So I'm sure we'll all go out into the evening with many questions um, stimulated and engaged by her work. Um, but thank you again for joining me. And it's a pleasure to share Schneeman's work with you this evening. <laughs>